So Postgres at scale, um, and I'm not quite talking about it in the exact same context as let's say Amazon RDS who has a different type of scale. We also have a type of scale that we need to deal with internally which is, comes in the form of um, lots of teams. So a uh, quick background on Groupon and what this means when I say large. Um, we uh, process a large number of transactions um, you can see some of the highlights there in terms of the size and scope for what it is that we do. We process a, f a fair amount of revenue that all hits databases. Um, and one of the things that we've run into because of this large proliferation of services and things that we provide is that uh, internally there's a lot of teams that have moved to SOA-based architectures. Uh, we've acquired teams. There's massive fragmentation of application stacks where, where just like everybody else in the industry recently, teams and companies have gone from monolith type infrastructures and spread out horizontally to service oriented type infrastructures. But this means as a result that um, lots of different applications are talking to different types of databases and with different queries and workloads. So we have large numbers of teams and large numbers of databases and instances and applications and services. And in order to provide a foundation or a service that can supply and satisfy the demand of applications and back these, these services that we provide, uh, we need to go in and figure out how to build uh, database as a service, right? And we've done that internally. So um, one of th what I'm here to talk about is how that you do that, what are some of the considerations that you need in order to have some of this happen. Um, feel free to ask questions if any of you want to uh, raise your hand along the way. Um, some of this is light on detail, some of it is, I, I have covered in other publications specifically on the OS side of things and what we do regarding storage, um, but I'll come back to some of those things. So, so databases, um, databases for better or worse is, are not just a single piece of software that you plop off in a data center, in a cloud, or wherever it is. Uh, a database is a collection of things, right? And just like ogres, uh, there are layers, and Postgres has many, many layers in order to make a successful database function um, inside of an organization. And it's not just about um, um, the, the Postgres process, right? Database is a constellation or a collection of things that need to be layered together in order to provide database services. So as, and they don't operate in a vacuum, right? Like again, Postgres, there is no such thing, and I, I, I challenge all of you to think about it. In your environment, when you say you have a database and you're providing database services, there is more than just Postgres, the process running in order to support that, right? You have backups, you have all kinds of things that, that go into supporting that infrastructure. So backing up, right, because database has all of these, the, these things internal, but like it sits in a really interesting place in organizations infrastructure, right? If you've got your typical software stack which goes from browser all the way down to a database, there's nothing else after the database, right? Like, like that's it. You have suite of different services and they all pass things through, right? They're doing some kind of processing, proxying, they're doing some kind of processing or forwarding or some other reasonably low latency thing, but then they get to the database, right? And that's why we're all here. So, and we really wish, and I'm sure all of us have thought this, that there was something else, right, beneath the database, right? Because then that would be the last thing in the chain, right? But it's not that way. So, um, the macro level of, of what a database is, is, is you know, things that the database needs to do is it's got a query planner, see, like there's a whole host of things that the database has that is this union of all of these other macro components. And it, this is unique in, in the software stack because most everybody, like application servers, they have CPU and maybe some network and that's about it, right? Like, but the database has, the, has all of these macro components, right? And if you think through this stuff, right, some of these are database, some of them are OS specific, right? So CPU is, is kind of a hardware thing. Disk IO is, is largely a hardware thing. Capacity is the amount of available resources. But then at the same time, you have to deal with set theory and understanding how databases work inside of the Postgres process itself, right? Um, and that's fantastic if you like a challenge, <laughs> right? When somebody comes to you and, and says, something slow, the worst, which is like 
the most interesting thing somebody can say because it also means that you have no idea what rat hole you're going to go you know, chasing down today, right? Somebody's gonna say it's you know, the CPU and you have the entire stack to go look at, right? Internally, we use FreeBSD to host our databases. So, you know, we've, uh, Brendan Gregg um, has done a fantastic, and it's unfortunate, it's cut off the URL at the bottom. Um, anyway, uh, these will be on the, on the slides. When I post these, there's a URL um, for where you can go pick this up off of Bren Gre Brendan Gregg's blog. But decomposing the actual box itself and the OS and all of the macro subsystems, you have to figure out how and where to go do this, right? And it's partially OS, right? A lot of times, like, the reason that the database was slow and some application engineer was complaining is because you ran into some system limitation, right? CPU wasn't fast enough, which typically means the query is talking to too many rows, not that the CPU was too fat or was, was too slow, right? Or, you know, large bulk insert came through and you ran into some like, you know, regression and things backed up or, you know, you spent a lot of time doing disk IO. These are all things that you have to go chase down and it really didn't have anything to do with Postgres. Right? One of the big things that we've noticed is, by and large, Postgres just works. Right? Like, and this is, was, was really interesting in walking around the conference because you don't hear about people like, talking about, hey, how do we like, you know, move Postgres forward in the industry or like, do all these things. Like, everybody kind of understands that now. It just works. Right? And it's not about Postgres entirely because like, Postgres is just this one part of the entire thing. It, it's, you know, it's all of the other things that you have to layer on top of that. Right? So in the case of the OS side of things, you have to you know, understand all this. So, um, you know, if, if, and if you begin to decompose what a database is, these are all the things that you have responsibility for that are in your domain when, as you are offering database as a service to your organization, right? You have the query engine, you have like, which is acting, and then behind that you kind of have the serialization layer, like, and that's a really important value prop and, and service that Postgres or databases provide, right? It does caching for you. You have to deal with that caching, right? You're dealing with it both inside of Postgres and you also have to deal with it inside of the OS and the file system layer, right? You are also in the business of storage, right? Like Postgres just added, for instance, uh, page checksums, right? So there's no way that we, any of us can deny that, that as a data, like somebody that provides databases, you're not in the storage business. You have to be aware of this. Right? There's page tearing and all kinds of awful things that can happen that will you know, result in a really miserable day for all of us. Um, and then you know, one of the things that's interesting also, especially with Postgres, um, which is a really, you know, if, any, if, I, if you would have asked me five years ago or 10 years ago if Postgres was gonna be a proxy, I would have said no, you know, GTFO, there's no way. Um, oops, so, oops, my slides are out of order. Um, so I'll come back to this slide. Here we go, there. I'll skip past what I, the fun part here. Um, so these are all of the things that you have to have some understanding of, right? You have to understand SQL. You have to understand how MVCC works. You have to understand how storage works with pages and bit rot and checksums and, and things of that nature. Shared buffers, the OS versus Postgres, and, and foreign data wrappers, which now is this really interesting you know, proxy, either proxy to a local process or proxy to a remote process. Right, in the case of uh, C store or let's say Postgres FDW or MySQL FDW. So that's your domain, that's what you need to go and satisfy, and then somewhere along the line you have to go and address all of the risk management parts that are attached to this, right? And by that, you know, you've got regulatory and a whole host of other things. But this is, this, this is what it means to be database, and it's the last thing in the, in the chain, chain of responsibility for being able to service something, right? Sweet. So. Since it is a Friday, um, and I, I want to have you know a little bit of a discussion, um, risk, right? We're in the business of managing risk, effectively, right? We're the keepers of the data, and that is one of the largest pieces of responsibility. And that responsibility you have to treat with some degree of care, right? So, is this risky, right? And there, there, there is yes and no, right? I, I'm trying to provoke a conversation. <laughs> there we go. It is risky, right? Because if something happens, right, you're going to lose data between, you know, when that commit goes off and the data shows up on disk, right? And this is particularly dangerous on block-oriented file systems, right? You really do want sync commit off if you trust your, if you need to guarantee your data, right? So, you know, how about this? Is this risky? Right? There's an extra little bit here, and let me see if I can, right? So. This little bit here, if you don't know what ZFS is, this is really interesting, and you know, 
this answer is going to be different for different organizations. Uh, in our case, by default, oh, we don't do this, or we do this, we do this by default in our organization, right? And I, I, like, I really want to provoke. For those of us not as familiar with GFS, what is that? It's a file system, but it's, it's a log structured file system. If you've heard of ButterFS or BTRFS, so what Sync disabled means that when the, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, when sync disabled means that when an application F syncs to the file system, the file system effectively ignores it, right? But here's why this is potentially not that risky on ZFS, right? We, and to be completely clear, there's that mandatory disclosure which is kind of cut off. We don't do this on all of our databases, right? We do do it by default on our non-core, non-critical databases, and there's a reason we do that because it does good things for performance, right? But um, what it means in the case of ZFS, because all these writes are coming in, they're written down in five, um, they're, they're, they're accepted in order, and then they're written down to disk in a, in a trans ZFS transaction group every five seconds, right? So assuming the synchronous commit, that information gets flushed to the, to the OS in the form of a write, then every five seconds that information is going to end up on disk in a file system consistent way. So if we lost power on any of our boxes, we have five seconds worth of exposure, right? Plus or minus a second or two, right? And that's it. There's no file system check in ZFS, by the way. So like if the box bounces, it comes back, it goes back to the last successful transaction group, and you're off to the races, right? And we have 100 and something terabyte boxes, and we bounce them, and it takes like, you know, 30 seconds <laughs> for it to get through the file system part, right? So is this, you know, risky? Well, I'm not risking anything from a file system perspective, right, because I'm sitting on this, this file system, which is fantastic. And from a database perspective, yeah, I'm, I'm risking five seconds worth of data, okay? But we're all in the business of risk management as, as database administrators and people that provide database services. So we're making this justification, or cost justification, because we're all, um, you know, we need to trade off, like, how much outage have people suffered as a result of a performance problem where the database became unbearably slow, and then th that provided back pressure into the application, backed things up, and you had a cascading failure, right? The flip side of that is, is you always alleviate that pressure by letting things roll through, and you accept this window of loss, right? And if you go and look at and do that calculus for, like, let's say, Mark, some marketing service that's churning away and beating on the database really aggressively, but the data's just not important, right? It's absolutely worth it, right? Because F-Sync is an amazingly expensive call. It's a really important call. It, it says that when an F-Sync happens, the data goes, gets flushed through the OS, down to disk, and it, everything's in a durable state, right? But if you've got 20 or 30 disks in a system, that F-Sync means that every single one of those disks has to be in a situation where it's in a known consistent state, and that's really hard to do in a performant way, right? So, yeah, I, 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 would, I, I challenge, I argue that this is not that risky when you, justif when you cost justify it and you weigh off or weigh this. And it's interesting because as database administrators, myself included, you're, you, everybody has this loss aversion, right? You wanna make sure that to the last transaction, it, the database will, will suffer and survive a power pull test without losing any data, right? But that means that that last trans five seconds worth of data, those last like five seconds transactions worth of information are really, really expensive, right? From a hardware perspective, from a hard scaling perspective, really, really difficult to go and um, scale horizontally because you're now paying this, this, this performance penalty that is, is really large, right? ZFS also lets you do random write and it on disk converts it to sequential I.O., and this is a really also awesome thing. So that's something I want to challenge you guys on. Feel free to, 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 to ping me offline, I guess, if, if you guys want, but um, think about it, right? Like from a loss aversion perspective to your organization, is it better to have a back pressure and outage because the database got slow during high periods of high write activity, or is it better to have that to, serve, to, to make sure that there's no data loss during that five second window of time. Go ahead. Have you experimented with the difference between synchronous commit versus the ZFS, ZFS fetch thing? Yes, and this is actually just this week. We actually had some really interesting benchmarks. Um, I can provide you with some of that information. Even with sync, and this was something that, that surprised everybody uh, by and large, is, is if you have sync disabled on ZFS and you do an F-sync, it actually does force 
information into the ZFS, uh, into the ZFS you know, uh, database is what I'm gonna call it, like it's actually a file system database. Um, um, and it forces some degree of consistency in the way that that information gets serialized into the transaction buffer. Um, so F-Sync is not entirely free with sync disabled. It just means that it does a whole lot less. It doesn't like rebuild this, this Uber block tree. Um, and there's a lot of really good talks on that. But uh, yeah, it is more expensive. So, um, or I'm sorry, there is an expense associated with F-Syncing against um, ZFS with sync disabled. Okay, so let me skip back to this. Okay, so when you're building a database, right, and you're creating this as a service, you start off with a single instance, right? And everybody's like, okay, great, I got a database, and this is what I was saying, like, nobody runs just this, right? You typically will have a slave. So if you got a slave, you got some, you know, replication, master slave, whatever, and, but then you need to have some kind of failover mechanism. So you're now, you know, adding some form of a load balancer, right, either doing IP sharing or using a load balancer and doing TCP proxying or like DNS-based, you know, VIP management. Uh, because somehow you need to get to the master because, you know, by and large, most all of us are probably relying on, on binary streaming replication. Um, but then you can't do that because a slave is not a backup, right? You need to have some kind of point in time recovery. So you, you now have to go and build this out. Uh, that's not good enough because you also need connection management on top of that. So now you have to handle, you know, the connection aspect of things. But even still, like, you don't have just one data center or like two servers in a single rack or adjacent racks or like, you know, two, data, two databases on the same floor. Um, you have to go and send this stuff off. You also have backups, right? Because you also want to like offsite some of this stuff. Um, and then, you know, you maybe you get like a little bit more sophisticated and you go in and you set up um, load balancing to your PG balancer instances so that you can toggle back and forth in a slightly more hitless way in the event that you want to do maintenance. Right, so these are now all the like some of the components that you are responsible for when you're building database, or some kind of a database as a service, right? We have, we have long since exited the single Postgres process world, right? Like, or, you know, collection of processes. Um, but these are all like, you know, a part of this, this family of things that you have to build and take into account, right? But when you go to the provisioning side of things, you have, you know, no fewer than five discrete components here, right? So times however many combinations. And this, this becomes an interesting challenge for management um, in terms of the, how do you go in and systematically, programmatically go in and flush this out, right? Like we've got configuration management stuff that do this. Um, and so, like I said, I'm gonna be giving a talk about, or like I'm pointing out there, I'm gonna give you giving a talk about that in a couple of weeks, um, more on the provisioning aspect of things. But the combination, the permutations, and the way that you need to take these building blocks and then deploy them in the environment kind of explodes. And when you're talking about hundreds or thousands of you know, timelines, is what I'm gonna call them, that you're managing, this can become kind of ugly and, and is really an interesting, like just, I don't call it mess, but like there's a lot going on there, right? So how do you manage that complexity? So you have to go and build checklists, right? Because even though you're doing these for different workloads, different teams, you have these standardized things that you have to do it because that's a part of your service definitions, right? So if you're building any kind of as a service, Postgres, even MySQL, we do that. Um, this is a Postgres conference, but we do offer this exact basically platform internally for MySQL users, right? And this checklist is by and large the same, right? It, it, these are just general things that you have to do as a service provider, but they're now your specialty because you own the service, which is all wrapped around Postgres, but like, you know, we're, we're here at like, you know, 10 steps, right? And that's great, but then, you know, you go look at the combinations here and, and this becomes a really big number, right? You've got the number of VIPs, you know, different backend targets, it, it kind of starts to explode on you, right? There's a large number of combinations. And then you get into this and you go, well, hold on a second, I'm not gonna go in like, you know, I can't rubber stamp this config out because my config is going to be different for a, a team that is 90% write volume, right? And is just gonna be fire hosing data in here and they have like, you know, PG Partman or something like that and they're doing partition management um, versus like some other application where they're doing very, very high, very high rate of queries very small transactions, and everything is reasonably well-tuned, but like totally different workloads, right? So you have these differing database parameters that you now have to take account for times, you know, n number of instances. So, okay, great. Um, regulatory requirements are a real interesting one. We're in a bunch of different countries and have a different, s e everybody, like the Venn diagram for like what you have to do in order to provide services for different teams that span different country regions is, is really, 
Um, interesting. I think that, that's the word I'm going to use. So, so tips for per, on the provisioning side of things. Find something. Automate it. You have to. You have to build this coherent model of what it is that you're doing on a per team basis. And each per team, it's kind of like you have to pull down each individual component and then figure out how to plug it into this framework that you've designed internally. So, um, you know, we use Ansible. Um, yeah, that's worked out very well for us because we can provide a coherent framework for an entire team, right? Um, so, or an entire deployment. Um, these other ones are kind of interesting things that have bit us. These are, these are lessons learned that we can communicate out. Like, um, the idempotent execution, right? If you have, let's say, shared buffers, and you have that in a config file, and you think you want to like, you know, change that value, and then you want to do a restart on Postgres automatically because you changed that parameter, that sounds fine and dandy until someday that happens in the middle of the day, right? You really don't want to have that happen. So if you go and deploy a Postgres instance, and you're using some kind of config management, push it out there and make the parameters that require a restart right, on, right once. You can't ever go back and revisit them. If you want to go in and change, let's say, the shared buffers on a Postgres instance, then you should go back, spin up a new slave someplace else, and then promote it, right? See, because that's now a controlled crash, right? In the sense, like, you know, fairy turn, what? It, it's controlled in the sense that you know that off hours, like, you've spun this up, it's replicated up, you can go and do this, and you can, like, you can make, that and make that kind of a change in an automated way. But if you go and set, like, you know, give every team this foot gun that says, hey, you go twiddle this knob, and I'm going to go, like, you know, let you restart, Right? You're going to be suffering the consequences of downtime constantly because teams are going to be doing this in a reasonably uncontrolled way. So providing this, this, this anti-foot shooting mechanism where by policy you just say, you know, I'm going, we're going to deal with this, this potential for downtime by saying we're not going to let you restart Postgres. We'll hop it for you. Right? And if you really do, like there are teams and databases where like, it's, it's completely unreasonable to, to you know, inf enforce this constraint. Well, you can go open up a ticket and have a DBA actually do it by hand, right? But from an automation perspective, absolutely not. Right? That's really dangerous. So, uh, questions so far on the provisioning side of things? Okay, fine. You guys are really sleepy right now. So, <laughs> let's see if I can live this up again. Um, <laughs> efficacy versus efficiency. One of the things that, that's, that's interesting to watch in this DevOps culture is that, you know, automate everything. Great. However, the efficacy of automation, where pe te people and teams and companies, I've watched this externally, blow tons of, of time and many, many, many man hours automating something that happens once every 12 months and it takes like five, 10 minutes to have happen. Who cares, right? Like the ROI means that you'd have to have this happen on like, you know, after you complete this automation thing, every like 30 minutes for the next two years before you're gonna get some kind of a break even. And that break even for ROI doesn't really happen. Right? So from a QA, from a repeatability perspective, yeah, document it. Go train people on it. Like, but don't get lost in the weeds on automation. This, 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 there is a trade-off here. Automate all the things. We definitely want to get to 100% automation, but you know, pay attention to the ROI. So connection management. So you've got this large fleet of databases. Teams really like to disconnect and reconnect. And people just assume stuff's going to work. And they don't understand the full stack. And you, don't, you can't fault them for that. You, like, it's outside their specialty. But like, you know, teams and people, this is a, an, an FAQ, especially like, you know, it's, it's just an FAQ at this point in time. Like, I have a connection string, and I've set it to like 2,000, and I expect it to be faster because I have 2,000 connections. And that's absolutely positively wrong. Doesn't work that way. So connection management's a big deal. Uh, we rely on PG Bouncer very heavily for this. Um, to the point that actually uh, taking a page from Ford, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. We say that on port 5432, you're using PG Bouncer in transaction mode, right? Just done. And if you're Java, you know, we'll deal with that in a second. But this has saved us an enormous amount of grief because we have throttled the throughput and the amount of abuse that the Postgres process and the back end will actually suffer, right? Like, for us, this has mitigated most of the situations where you know, we're going to have a load average of 2,000 because we have 2,000 connections that are all trying to do something equally you know, content, like some form of contention. Right? It's just gone. It, it, it means that our load average will get busy. We'll have like you know, 40 core box. We'll have a load average of 40 or 60 on busy boxes. And then it'll come back down to something that's reasonably managed. But like, 
it, does, it, it, it always means that we're no longer in a situation where everything slows and comes to a grinding halt because we've got this governor in place. And that's really what PG Bouncer is, is it's a governor to make sure that, that, um, that, that the Postgres process does not back up, right? It acts as this short circuit in order to prevent excessive load from basically slaughtering the OS. Like Postgres as a scheduler will happily accept all work. And PG Bouncer, because it has this connection limit, allows us to mitigate that. So when you're dealing with large numbers of teams, you don't know what, who's going to do what or at what time of the day. This is a really effective, really, really effective control. And so building these kind of controls in the environment where, again, you can have any color car as long as you, you uh, any color car you, you want as long as it's black, this works really well. Um, we do offer session mode. We put that on a different port. We make it the non-standard port, right? We, that way, it's like an extra thing in order to go and do something that's potentially going to be abusive, right? But the default mode of operation is we're not going to let you be abusive of the system that is being provided. So uh, rule of thumb uh, is we have settled on, on this kind of formula, which is you allow M connections to the back end, and that's a, you know, derived from the number of cores on the box times how, like some K value, and that's you know, the amount of in-flight transactions that are off CPU and scheduled for some external resource. That almost always means disk, and we find that it's you know, typically two to one, somewhere in that neighborhood, one and a half to one, uh, depending on the speed of the disks. Um, it actually may be interesting to go back and look and see if that correlates with random page cost. But. So, JDBC, <laughs> just, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, I, it is the bane of my existence, and it's nothing against the language. It is entirely this little piece of software and specification and driver for the way that applications always talk to the database. And anyway, there you go. So I just learned actually at this conference that apparently in 1.6, there's uh, PG Bouncer will now open up a transaction whenever a prepare is sent. So transaction mode just kind of works transparently um, for PG Bouncer. I don't know if somebody, okay. Uh, any, one six, I haven't dug into it. I, I just learned that. So, um, you know, the, the use of being at a conference, right? Um, so starting in one six, this may be significantly less painful, painful because transparently it'll just work without having to tell your JDBC connections that they need to have this prepare th threshold zero. Uh, it, oddly enough though, that does uh, result in a performance boost. <laughs> because it reduces the amount of round trips between the application and the client. And that's, uh, that's been amusing for teams to discover and watch their reaction because they're like, well, it should be faster. And you, you, yeah, but you've reduced the number of trips. And they're like, yeah, but, you know. So um, there you go, covered that. So backups, right? You've got this big system. Uh, slaves are not backups, right? This is probably the most common thing that I see, um, have seen over many years, not just at Groupon, but like many, many years, people think of a slave as a backup, and it's just not, right? Like, basically, moving on. I, it, it's would potentially debatable. Is replication plus snapshots, right? Is that a backup? Right, if the retention period is long enough, you've offsited it to a remote location, and you can go and query it at any time. Can you reuse an offsite snapshot as a, you know, CFS doesn't have bugs. <laughs> Neither does any SAN I've ever used. That's, that's exactly. Um, anyway, so yeah, you need to have some separation of systems there. But it, it is like, you know, depending on what it is that you're actually trying to protect against, it actually does act as a reasonable. But it's not, it's not bulletproof. I'm not trying to say you can get away with that. Um, so it's debatable. But anyway, we see this. Uh, Constantly, large numbers of teams, lots of teams doing things in the middle of the night, just deadlines, whatever else. Uh, schemas, automated schema processes are really famous for doing this. Um, I, I don't understand necessarily, like, but that is, comes back to the loss aversion aspect of things. Like you, you measure twice, cut once. That doesn't happen through automation. Um, going back to that item potent comment earlier regarding provisioning. Uh, when you go and you look in a directory and something's gone that you very much expected to be there um, because you're creating file systems and mounting file systems and like the data under that file system just kind of disappeared for some reason, uh, automation is, is good and bad. But, and, and, and most of the outages that we've had, not outages, um, most of the incidents where we had, you know, we need to go back to some kind of point in time recovery have been as a result of automation, right? There, there's definitely a cost to some of this stuff. 
So how do you mitigate this, right? How do you prevent the foot shooting, right? You have to design this big system or like series of systems that's going to accommodate like 95% of everybody's needs out of the box, right? That, so how do you do that? You go and create, give everybody a, uh, give everybody their own database, but you don't give it to them so that they're the owner of it because now you're just inviting trouble. Now, now these things will actually succeed, right? The drop database one in particular, drop table is like, yeah, that's a partial outage or pro partial failure. Um, but a drop database is a little bit more of you know, higher magnitude. Maybe the application will continue to go. So um, we use the PGHBA very successfully to limit uh, the database connections so that at only one time, you can have two connections connecting to your database instance, right? And this means that your scheme upgrades are limited from a couple of hosts, very specific hosts, which are hopefully different than your application hosts, right? And then on the firewall side of things, um, so going through what, the, what we, what we uh, have found to work reasonably well, and this works well from an operations perspective, or uh, I don't wanna say open revolt, but it, it took a while for everybody to kind of move into this mindset where you can't, from any arbitrary host, go in and perform some kind of DDL upgrade, right? How, like the, enforcing some release engineering standards and process at the database level um, was an interesting series of discussions. Um, organizationally, that change was not free, right? But it's resulted in a large amount of value for the company and for people that are using the service. So what we do is, is we actually offer the DBA account. We actually have Postgres only listening on port 15432, right? Not the defaults of 5432, not 6432, where both of those are reserved for PG Balancer, 15432. The reason we do that is so that we can actually have these connection limits mean something. If the only way that, that people are able to access the database is through PG Balancer, well, PG Balancer acts as this like, you know, M to N, you know, proxy, so you have no idea how many actual DB connections or DBA account connections are actually present on the system. So if you limit this stuff, fantastic, right? So now you've got two, at any one time, a max of two concurrent connections to go, that can go and make DDL changes and, for application teams. And this forces rigor on their part. Everybody, by and large, benefits. Fair amount of grumbling until that kind of gets automated on their end, um, for better or worse. But it, the amount of... Um, incidents where we have seen drop table or drop database or you know application host A talking to the prod database or application host in staging talking to like the wrong those have gone like largely gone to zero now so fantastic like we've addressed this class of problem um, and then similarly uh, the connection limits for the application you know that we pass out to teams we set the connection limit reasonably low to begin with. We keep the max connection inside of Postgres reasonably high so that at any one point in time, we can go in and you know, bump this connection limit on the fly without having to do a restart of Postgres because again, if you do that, you should go and provision a new instance and then fail over to it and you know, move on with life. But this works out, has worked out pretty well for us. So, questions so far? So incident response, right? You've got all these systems in place and you have teams that are going off and, and you know, really aggressively pounding on the system. What happens when somebody says something's slow, something's broken, something's down, right? There's all kinds of different scenarios that you need to go and chase. And you know, in the operations lifecycle there, you've got different things. Well, as the database is a service provider internally, uh, there's lots of things that you can do to show up in these response elements where, where you're able to you know, more quickly remediate the problem, right? 99% of the time, it's not Postgres, but it is some interaction between the application, the environment that results in some form of degradation. Um, on Tuesday of this week, I would spent the better part of a day hunting down a TP99, you know, query response problem that had something to do with an F-sync on a master and the, and the query response problem was happening on the slave and like, you know, wasn't necessarily the database. The database wasn't broken, but like, this interaction of things and events and circumstances resulted in, in this you know, problem where for 10 seconds, right, in the middle of the night, oh, dark 30, uh, we saw query response times from a particular process go from 50 milliseconds to one and a half seconds, right? And it only lasted for 10 seconds. But like, you know, this kept kind of happening and it wasn't, you know, a batch job or anything like that. It kind of was moving around as time, but like you have to show up for these kind of response events and have something in your playbook and, and like come prepared 
and this pre preparedness aspect of things largely as a result of you doing work in advance, understanding the, the probable forms of outage or incidents that you're likely to go and deal with, right? The most common one probably is locking, right? Having scripts like this so that when somebody calls and says, hey, something's on fire, whatever, um, I need some help, right? I'm trying to run a truncate and it's not working and there's a vacuum running. And the user had no idea, right? So having these types of, of canned queries that you can just pull out, plop on the machine, done, right? Being able to answer the question, which process is blocking what process and why is really useful, right? Because like now you've got this, this thing that you can go and execute on and you can automate this to go and figure out like, hey, what's the health of this database? Uh, uh, it's too small. Um, Josh wrote this very fantastic, and I keep cribbing it and using it over and over and over. Index bloat. <laughs> Some of these queries, and the reason I have this in here is not because I want you to like, you know, check your eye quality, but like this is a CTE, and you know, it's a very large query. A lot of these queries that we have developed are large and expensive and insanely useful because as a, an administrative tool, this is something that's pretty unique for Postgres as an administrative thing where you can query the system catalogs in very intelligent ways, right? Doing a select start of PG stat activity is great, uh, but it's pretty high level, right? But if you wanna go in like, you know, if you have some theory about what's going on inside of the database, you can go and develop these really sophisticated queries to go and ask these really sophisticated questions of the database and go get that information back pretty quickly, right? It gets a little ugly, uh, like, or long, right? Um, but it's very useful, very, very useful, right? Um, the, the, the battery of these things that, that you can, should, should is probably the wrong word, but like it's advantageous to develop in advance um, is, is legion. Like you just, it, it's the gift that keeps on giving because you can now pass this on, right? You've got this big distributed environment providing services to large numbers of team, and now you have to have, you have this training element Right? Because at some point, you know, everybody's gonna come and go and there's, there's turnover and whatever else, and you need to be able to train the next guy, and so now you've got like, some prescriptive way to go and do things. So I'll come back to that point in a minute. Duplicate index is a really common one. Things are slow, why? Well, there was a release, okay, what happened? Well, hmm, turns out that you not only have this really expensive index with really terrible cardinality, uh, you have two or three or four of them, right? Um, and for whatever reason, they're just renamed and like different teams added, you know, conflicting indexes to the same set of database and like, or it's just, it's been there for two years and it finally becomes a problem because the query plan changed, it, right? The stats are such that it actually decided to use one of these or something. So some of the, the, of the, the top used queries that we have internally um, are these guys here. So I actually moved through that a lot faster than I expected. Um, I cut out a handful of things. One, I guess, so I'm gonna go back a little here. Um, are there questions first off? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are, they, they are. Um, they're kind of traded on the black market as like currency. <laughs> if, I had, I, if I had to describe like, so, so why aren't these like available as a package? I would say it's because these types of queries are largely traded on the black market. <laughs> and you accumulate them and you're like, oh, that's really, and then once you kind of get into the mindset of developing the, these techniques, um, you know, it's really useful. Like the, the, the system administration aspect of this would be the equivalent of like, you know, knowing how to put together a shell pipeline, like, you know, grab this command, pipe awk this, go do something, and you get some useful that, that does some analysis for you and tells you something. This is effectively what it is, but it's done on SQL. And like on the system administration side, for instance, you know, there's not a whole lot that will tell you that, right? Like uh, it, would be, it would be really interesting if this, this kind of thing existed but for the database using queries, right? Um, it doesn't. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Steve. Using the, uh, I mean, it's just all catalog-based stuff. Have you considered, uh, you know, a path to make it a view that exists inside of core? Uh, that would be a great suggestion. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, no, I have I not. Like 
I, I take a lot of these kind of scripts and I have them so that I just run them in a fire hose, like and I have like a, a, a on the networking side of things, like at the equivalent of like a show tech support, and I just gather all this information, and then I go and look at it. That's effectively what I do, just so I can shotgun through it. Go ahead, Josh. Um, a lot of, uh, I was just wanted to say answer everything. Um, a lot of scripts like that, uh, yeah. we have available on GitHub in the PGS script repo. Cool. Um, just, you know, things like that, uh, duplicate indexes, index flow, table flow, checking locks, that sort of thing. Yeah. Some of, the, some of these queries I've had for like, 10 years, and like the like column name changed one day, and you go know, from like release to release, and you go, damn it. <laughs> and actually, honestly, like we, we have a package them as an extension to Postgres because a lot of our clients are on RDS, and we can't install them as an extension. Anybody from it? Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, one of the, the, the most common problems that we have, going back to the, the, the way that we provision accounts, um, you know, it's not free to be able to provide this kind of constrained environment where we, uh, I'll keep looking. Um, it's one, not free to be able to go and do this kind of you know, restrictive thing where you provide a non-super user account to teams. So creating extensions, oh my goodness, we get that constantly. Um, so you know, there, there's, that's one thing. The other one that's really interesting um, is you, you can't select out of PG locks. If you're a customer of the database, they're perfectly talented engineers that could go and query the locks table, but it's not available right, to a DBA. You can't delegate that to somebody. You can create a stored procedure that'll go and do that potentially, but you have to go do work to do that. It's not something that's out of the box. Go ahead. Yeah, that would, I mean, that would be really fantastic, right? Like if I'm, and there's no inheritance on users, right? Like what we really want is we want like, you know, an instance owner kind of. You can't drop your own instance, like you can't remove the current directory that you're in on using, you know, uh, file system metaphor, right? You want a DBA account so that they have basically control of their own little container, right? And then you want them to be able to see everything inside of that container, right? Um, that just doesn't exist right now. Um, so yeah, doing it as a view through it, like you know, some ele a function that gives elevated privileges, um, so security definer. Go ahead. You actually probably could produce what you were describing, uh, depending on how you're containerizing. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if you're doing it based on like if you have a role naming convention mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, or you could do what roles inherit what from what roles. Mm -hmm. if, if you build a hierarchy of roles. Oh, it's um, definitely. It's not free. Yeah, that's, exa that's exactly it, right? So now you have, like, you have this company-specific ism that now needs to be explained, right? So right now, like, this is just one of the things that we have to deal with, and it's a source of friction, right? Uh, not that it's invalid or doesn't work, but it's just it's friction, right? Um, so the other one is, is, is standardizing on little things like this where you say explicitly prod DBA, right? There's no mistaking this. I thought that was the staging user, or I thought that was the UAT user, the prod, like dev. No, no, no. It's in the username. It's in the host name, right? You put these warning flags up there so that people will, like, you know, have this last minute reminder. And that's actually caused, you know, that little ounce of prevention where you get that in front of people's faces. It's not the same username across, you know, the prod staging and, and, and dev databases. You, you make them deliberately unique. It either prevents it at login or it provide, gives people a visual cue that says, Oh, I copy and pasted the prod thing, and it, it, it like people can be tired. They're not that tired, <laughs> right? Mistakes happen, but like that one is an easy one. That, that that ounce of prevention has actually gone a long way for us. Go ahead. So I could offer another suggestion. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we found that worked with the whole prod, dev prod mm -hmm. thing, is to actually set the uh, prompt in PSQL. Yes. Yes. Um, our issue is, is we are the reason that we don't do ha, haven't done something like that is because we don't allow people to have local access to the boxes, right? Uh, we give them remote access, and that's it. Right, but now the .psql shells, all PSQL RCs, those are client side, right? And so I have no idea what host they're going to come from, right? Like I would have to go and, and generate one of those for each host that's connecting through here. Right, but you you could at least. Oh, yeah. say, yeah. You can actually do a dset by querying the database and say, oh, is the domain I'm in prod? Then oh, send that's... out the ANSI color code for red. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow that. <laughs> I will post that and get I've, that out. I've done that. 
That's a good one. I like that a lot. That's actually a really good one. Yeah. Um, Harder to screw that up. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's that would be really useful. So, um, other questions? Like I said, I did go through some of this really quickly, um, and I actually pared back some of my slides because I thought I was going to be over. But others? Go ahead, Josh. We're using um, Ansible's The Biggie. Um, yeah, right now we do that just because it's multi-host, it executes in serial, it's easy to debug. Um, we compile out plain text file artifacts because then we can inspect it. Um, you know, one of the things that's really important, like I, I think I, I hinted at this a second ago, was um, I don't care how slow something runs. Um, yeah, like unlike, let's say, uh, dynamic container environments where you potentially want to spin them up and spin them down and like you want to have them be this kind of commodity. Right? Databases are kind of special in this world because they're, they have mass, they have important information and it's stuck on this machine right? or series of machines. And you don't want to go and blow it away. You don't want to recreate it. You don't want to give people the opportunity to like, you know, foot gun, you know, ha cause some kind of a problem. So you, know, you don't provision that often. We can run through this stuff in a reasonable amount of time right? It's not days, it's not like milliseconds, but like it's okay, right? It's, it, it happens in, you know, a handful of minutes and that's, that's acceptable. Um, so Ansible is a, a biggie. Uh, we looked at all their alternatives, um, but that's what we ended up settling on there. Um, the talk that I'm going to be giving sh uh, soon has something to do with console for, for clustering and orchestration. Um, so, yeah. Other tools, questions? No? <laughs> Um, it's Friday. I will give you guys back three minutes of time then. <laughs>